All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Phil. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the Student Affairs Facility, we are very humble and grateful that Phil Manzanera accepted our invitation to the show. Phil, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for having me on your show oh, from no, Washington. Thank Fantastic. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born again in a musical family? And how old were you when you perhaps began taking, you know, piano lesson or guitar lesson? Let's go back to the beginning. I uh, I was born uh, in London yeah. to a Colombian mother from Barranquilla and a British father. <clears throat> I would say my mother had music in her because in her, you know, my DNA uh, from Latino music comes from her. <clears throat> but she started having guitar. We, 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 we went to live in Havana, Cuba in 1957. <clears throat> and she started having guitar lessons when I was six years old. And then she um, got fed up with me touching her guitar all the time and said, I'm going to have to teach you a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to drive me crazy. So she started teaching me acompañamiento yeah. to uh, accompanying some chords and things like picking and playing chords to Latino songs, evergreen songs, songs, uh, you know, that <clears throat> that you hear now still. You probably know the words. So, um, when, although actually eventually it became Cuando Salí de, de Cuba, uh, yeah. um, Ese Lunar que te decía Lito Lindo, you know, all those kind of songs. <clears throat> so that guitar, which I still have, uh, 1957 uh, Havana, that's what I started on. <clears throat> I didn't start on anything to do with rock and roll or anything like that. It was all Latino stuff. And so, obviously, the music in Cuba was incredible. And as a little boy, I was taken to the, you know, asleep most of the time to the Tropicana Club, to all the San Susi clubs like that, where my parents wanted to party, but they had to take along the little boy and he could fall asleep at the table and then put him in the car or whatever. <clears throat> so, so, that, so that's when I first became interested in music and so uh, uh then after the revolution we had to leave and we went to hawaii for a year and then hawaiian music and then to caracas venezuela yeah. and and then i kept going to colombia <clears throat> from uh because i have like 60 cousins in Colombia, a big family, <clears throat> and some of them were musical. And in a little village, well, it's a little town called Girardot, which yeah. is straight down from Bogota. My one of my uncles lived, and I remember sitting on a like a dirt road uh, with my cousins, and they were playing a tiple. <clears throat> so my uncle said, "Should we buy a tiple?" So we went to a little casita. And up concrete thing, and they're the bodies of the tea player, and, and they said, choose a body, and then they string it up for you. And so I had a tea player. <clears throat> and so one of my cousins played jazz piano, eventually went to New York and played jazz. So there was a bit of music around all the time. <clears throat> but then I heard rock and roll music, and I heard it from uh, the radio, listening to London on the BBC World Service, and I saw it in films, Elvis Presley films, <clears throat> and American college kids who'd come out to Venezuela for vacations <clears throat> would play at parties, and they would play Buddy Holly and uh, <clears throat> uh, things like that. <clears throat> so me and my Venezuelan friends could see how uh, all the girls in our class were like, looking at these boys and so we said we got to get electric guitars my me and my friend miguel sanchez vegas we got to get guitars electric guitars we got to learn how to play we'll get girls <laughs> terrible really <clears throat> uh, uh, um and so that's why i became local about 
pop music, rock music. You could get a few things there, The Shadows, Cliff Richard, um, Jerry and the Pacemakers, whatever. <clears throat> but I, I said to my parents, send me to England, to boarding school. I was age nine. I want to go to England. They sent me to boarding school in South London. And the six, you know, in, in September 1960. So I was there at the prime time for rock and roll and everything happened. The Beatles, the Stones, everything that happened in England in the 60s just went into my brain. <clears throat> and I became mad about pop music, rock music, guitars, amplifiers. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I, I know that you, you attended the... Dulwich College in Southeast London and yeah, make a big impact. Feel free to all my questions feel are open ended, so I'm I'm like a psychologist. Yeah. I'm here to listen. So, uh -huh. so you then you begin hanging out with a lot of very good friends and kids like uh, Bill and McCormick, Charles Hayward, <laughs> and so on. Charles Hayward, that's right. And <clears throat> they were good friends, and they were they, they ended up being very good musicians and. We had a school band, and then, um, you know, they were, uh, Bill uh, mother knew Robert Wyatt's mother. Robert Wyatt was in a band <clears throat> called Soft Machine, and they were one of the coolest bands with Pink, early Pink Floyd in London, during Psychedelia and all this. And so also David Bowie was starting out near Dulwich, at Beckenham, and people would come back to school in the morning and say, oh, we saw this guy, he's playing at the pub called David Bowie, you know, and he's really good. So, you know, we ha had our ear to the ground and we felt close to people who were in bands. <clears throat> and then when I was 16, my brother took me to meet a friend of his who just joined a band <clears throat> to ask him, Uh, how to become a professional musician. And and like the week before, he had just joined a band, and that was David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. So, you know, if you, when you're young, I was 16, <clears throat> if you can meet somebody who is successful when you're young, you can, you, as a mentor almost, you can actually believe that you too could be successful or in the music business and it's so important for young people to have mentors or people they look up to and it's important for older musicians to help out younger musicians or give them advice <clears throat> of course he can't remember um what he said to me but they actually i was having dinner with him on saturday <laughs> he said i think you owe me 20 percent of everything you've earned because Whatever advice I gave you must have been good because five years later you managed to join Roxy Music. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then was uh, you know, you were turning, you know, finishing the middle high school here. Was uh, you you were telling your parents, man, I like music, I like music. Was any pressure, a family pressure to say, hey, forget about music, it's a crazy life, you're not going to make any money, go to school, go the easy way, enroll in college or 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 Yeah, yeah, but my father died in Venezuela when I was 15. Oh, so my poor mother was sort of, uh, she didn't really know what rock music was. She knew about cumbia, salsa. And I said, I want to be a pop musician. She said, what's okay? What's that? You know, I said, don't worry about it. Uh, it's be all right. And my, that's where my brother said, look, let's go and talk to this guy. Ask him what you have to do to become a professional. Yeah. But I said to her, look, I'm going to try it out. I'll apply to university, but if something happens, I'll only go to university, give me more years to try and get into a band. And I just got lucky. Well, I don't know if it's luck or good. <laughs> you were, you Karma. were that talented to begin with, I suppose, right? So Gabriel Imrel or, you know, Roxy Music and all the people that you, you pay later on in life. Yeah, you, no, well, you know, help your career, but you, you did have it in you, I think, right? So. Well, um, I was just so lucky to meet those people at that time in my life. It was fate, you know, just complete accident. It's like, you know, people say accident of birth. You're in the right place at the right time. 
<clears throat> you know, I, I I joined on a week after my 21st birthday. On my 21st birthday, I had nothing. I was looking into the abyss. I had no band, nothing. <clears throat> my my other friends had, had joined other bands. I had nothing. And then a week later, I re-auditioned for Brian Ferry, Brian Eno, Andy Mackay, Paul Thomas. <clears throat> they said, do you want to join? The week after that, I joined. And then we signed the contract the, the week after that uh, with the management. And then six weeks later, I did three gigs. We were in the studio recording the first album. Yeah. And the album came out on the same day as David Bowie's album, Spy, um, uh, with Spiders from Mars, you know, that album. And um, he saw us and we supported him and he loved us. And we were hit. Yeah, well, like, before we go into uh, Roxy Music, it, it was another important band it, that, uh, that you formed, like a progressive rock work, Quiet Sun. And, uh, with, yes, well, quite, yeah. with, with my school friends, uh, yeah. Charles Hayward and Bill McCormick, yeah. and we auditioned a keyboard player who, who, out of all the people who could have joined, it turned out to be somebody who had been at our school. We wow. was older than us. We had no idea. <clears throat> um, and we formed this band called Quiet Sun, which couldn't get a, a recording contract. But five years after Roxy, we recorded a Quiet Sun album. And that has been a very popular and was the basis of the 801 Live project, actually, <clears throat> later. But those... Uh, uh, that kind of music, well, it's sort of progressive. It wasn't really like prog rock, like Genesis. It was more like trying to copy Soft Machine, the first Soft Machine. Yeah. Uh, and um, it still sounds good. In fact, um, about nine months ago, I was listening to radio BBC Six Music here <clears throat> on a Sunday night. I was doing some cooking, and uh, the guy said, and our record of the week is... Mainstream by Quiet Sun. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my, I quickly text the other, you know, Bill and Charles and everything. I said, 45 years later, we're actually on the radio. Wow. <laughs> it's a special featured album. I can't wow. believe it. It sounded, still sounds terrific. So, you know, I'm very proud of that album. And, um, you know, that they... Both Bill and Charles, you know, they came to the the last Roxy gig I did at, here in London, the O2, you know. So we're still friends. Yeah, good for you. And then, uh, so then, you know, Roxy Music came to the picture with, with of course, Brian Ferry, Brian Eno, and Paul Thompson, Andy McKay, and those are big, big names. And they, at the time, you were you were, were a kid, 21, 22 years old, whatever. And then uh, you ever thought that? That you guys will kind of, will become that popular, you know, down the road. Or what was the motivation to form proxy music to begin with? Well, um, you know, the, the, obviously I joined late, didn't yeah. I? <clears throat> A year after they'd really started forming. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> you know, they were clever guys. I knew when I first met them that they were special, <clears throat> and I was just thrilled to be in a professional band, quite frankly. You know, <clears throat> I had no thoughts about what might happen in the future. No bands did in those days. They just, you join the band almost like joining the Navy or something to see the world. And you just expected it was only going to last a year or two years. You never expected it to be, here we are 50 years later. That's just like ridiculous, really. <clears throat> so you just live in the moment. It really was, you know, <clears throat> but luckily that every moment was exciting <laughs> and people, more and more people said they liked us. And um, so it was just incredibly, incredibly exciting. You're on the journey and you didn't look back. You just kept looking forward. And, you know, we were suddenly successful. We were different. We 
you know, when we came to America, we came to America in that first year, around Christmas time, 72. And um, <clears throat> thinking that we would be immediately successful in America, and we weren't. They, it, 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 you know, people found us too weird. And uh, people threw stuff at us. Really? You know, like water bombs. <clears throat> you know, I always remember there was a gig in Fresno. <laughs> Uh, we were supporting a Carlos Santana's brother called uh, Jorge Santana, and it was called Malo, their band. <clears throat> and um, I always remember some guys shouting, "Get off stage, you faggots!" You know, and throwing stuff at us. And we just kept on playing. So we're going to play this music. Whatever you throw at us, it doesn't matter. We're playing. You know, it was a bit like pro rock then, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but they just couldn't handle, you know, the way we looked and the music uh, that was coming out. And, um, you know, so that was, um, we realized how difficult it would be to try and make it in America. And, then, and it was all very big. You know, we'd be playing pubs and clubs in England yeah. and maybe some small theaters. But uh, it was like, wow welcome to the real world it's like the this is big time in america and we're just like little people so um but it didn't worry us we went back to england and got on with recording the next album and then the next album and then the next album and tour and we did a lot of hard work for many years um because that's what you had to do and we love doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And then you guys were playing, 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 touring, touring, and then in, I think it, what was what happened between seventy six and and seventy eight that you guys all started stop. You were doing your own thing. You end up releasing your first record, I suppose. And you get you get to a point as a band that hey, we need to, you know, not break the band, but split for a while, do our own thing, and then come back. And... <clears throat> well, I, I wish it. It was as planned as that, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was like, um, yeah, after about five albums, so in 1975, by 1975, we'd recorded five albums, five hit albums. <clears throat> yeah. And I think, you know, we had had the opportunity to do solo albums as well. So we had five Roxy albums and we had maybe each had about three solo albums as well. I mean, I can't believe that we did so much work all of us the whole time we were and then it it was um i think brian really decided that he wanted to have a break but he didn't tell us of course <laughs> but he i think he wanted to try and like make it on his own and um he moved to america he moved to la and he had a a very glamorous girlfriend, Jerry Hall, <clears throat> and it all seemed to be, you know, going well. And as always, you know, uh, we just got on with our own solo things and just followed our nose. And that's when I did the thing with Eno, uh, the 801 Live uh, project, uh, which <clears throat> was only designed to last six weeks. And it was an experiment in putting uh people who are very interested in technical side of music together with people who are non musicians mm -hmm. you know and uh, see and putting them in a room and seeing what came out of it if they battled away <laughs> and we created something that was pretty unique still sounds great today but we only did three gigs one was recorded and that's been probably the most successful solo project that I've ever, ever been involved in. And of course we had one of the most famous drummers now of uh, old Simon Phillips uh, on drums. And he was like 18 at the time, you know, and uh, after that concert, he got offers from Jagger, from Jeff Beck, from just so many people and has played with so many famous people. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, the rest of us 
some were there was a blues a black blues player there was eno there was me there was a a technically brilliant pianist who had been in a band called sky francis monkman yeah and and it was an incredibly intense period of six weeks. The concerts and then boof, that was it, disappeared. But uh, Eno went off to work with Bowie pretty much for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah, that was and, uh, one, the band uh, 800-101. So it's a name, big name there. Lloyd and Frank, yes. Brian Eno, Bill, Simon Phil. Yeah, I have interview. I interviewed Simon and I'm going to be interview with uh, Francis uh, surely and uh, it's, uh, man, the best of the best, man. And Simon yeah, and was Bill, a kid, was like 17, 18 years old. 18, that's right. And I mean, Bill McCormick, the bass yeah. player, who doesn't play now because he has some illness <clears throat> in his hands. I mean, so many bass players now cite that album and his bass playing on it. Well, the rhythm section of the two of them, because mm -hmm. Bill came from the Jack Bruce school of bass players, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so, and he had played with Robert Wyatt uh, on his solo stuff, uh, Matching Mole, <clears throat> anyway, as well as being in Quiet Sun and stuff. So it was an absolutely terrific band, and it was a magical moment that was captured, luckily, on um, on on vinyl. And... Uh, you know, so that was really, I don't know what kind of music you'd call that. It was such a mixture of stuff. It's not really prog, but it has got elements of prog rock in it. But but it's just, well, I, I'm speechless. I can't even say, I can't work it out. But there's lots of rev nice reviews where they explain it. Oh, <laughs> but, awesome. uh, and you, you play with Brian Eno on a couple of albums too. The Here Come the World Jet and... Uh, yes. Mountain by Trey, so you have a good... Yeah, I co-produced co uh, that, uh, Taking Tiger Mountain, and worked on that, and a couple of tracks on Another Green World. And then he played on a lot of my solo stuff over the years. And, of course, he's 10 minutes from me here, as is Brian Ferry 10 minutes from me here, and, and as is Mandy Mackay. 10 minutes from so we you know we're all here we're all doing music which is wonderful to think 50 years later we're still all doing new stuff and um in fact i'm doing an album with andy instrumental album right now and um so we we continue this is what we do we, we make music and um Luckily, because of the way the industry has changed, we don't have to go and ask permission. We can just do it like anyone else, just put it out ourselves. Right. And and it's, um, you know, it's just a, it's what we do in life, you know. And <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, that whole period, yeah, I did a lot of producing. And uh, John Cale, I worked with Nico. I'd have to have a look at a list. I did so <laughs> I play with everybody. <laughs> one of one of the other great collaborations that you have was with uh, with the album L with Cuddly and Cream, Little Cream, and uh, feel free to elaborate. I think um, use a, a particular approach in the creation of the song, as in Brasilia. But feel free to elaborate on what. You know. Well, <clears throat> that was actually in the period after eight oh one and before yeah. we got back together with Roxy and. Kevin Godley was my next door neighbor, and uh, they just left NCC, and, and and him and Lowell were uh, partners working and yeah. stuff. And they said, "Do you want to form a band?" I said, "Well, yeah, why not?" So we started doing an album together, and um, eventually, uh, Brian Ferry rang up and said, "Can we get Roxy back together?" And I said, "Well, I've just..." Ju start another band and he said well you could do both i said oh yeah okay of course i couldn't because <laughs> we yes, ended up yeah. <laughs> we we ended up doing a lot of the rock stuff in new york so yeah. kevin and lol then changed the name of the album and it became the god and cream album you know and some of the stuff but yeah we we we, we, ha we did some they were great very talented people and and when I say we 
wrote stuff together. We didn't really. We, we said, look, let's have an experiment where each of us goes into the studio for two hours, does whatever they want, and the next person goes in for two hours, do it, but not listening to what the other person did. And then the next person. So then we all come together at the end, and then we put up the faders, <laughs> see what kind of monster we've created. So that track, <laughs> was done and then we started crafting it and stuff but it was um you know that they're, they're great you know they these are art school kids that who went to art school and they were like you know trained to to, to work in different ways from just normal musicians you know yeah, yeah. kevin is uh i interviewed him a couple of times and uh he's a very nice guy i never met the law no. i think they're they grew apart a little bit. I don't know if they're talking to one another anymore, but, you know, whatever, have a, who I am to criticize, you know, any musician. But uh, they were, as uh, after 10 CC or in between, they, they formed a, a great partnership and they did videos when, you know, with MTV at the way, and they, they were way ahead of the times in many ways. Like both, way, way ahead of the time. Yeah, way ahead of the time. Another monster that, you know, had vision, you know, that. Uh, he, you know, so gave it um, Godly and and, uh, and and Lowell Green was amazing duo. And, uh, well, I, I remember when 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 they were doing videos and they used to he used to Kevin used to do some of the editing at home next door to me, and I went down and I watched the the um, police video for every breath you take That's in right. the you know when he was editing it there, you know, which is an incredible a video and an incredible song such a hit everywhere yeah. and um yeah those guys are just so talented it's just ridiculous yeah amazing so then you know the, your buddy from roxy music call you back hey let's put the band together and then you begin you know uh, re recording again touring again and you guys did very well you know feel free to, to elaborate and well, then we lasted another five years. It seems like five-year little bursts of five years, and then everyone gets fed up and then stops. <clears throat> and then, so there's the first five years, then there's two years off for good behavior. Then there's five years again, mm -hmm. and then there's 18 years off for bad behavior. <laughs> and then we get back together again in 2001 for five years, and then everyone wants to kill each other and then we get back together after the rock and roll hall of fame do that and then this tour that we've just done celebrating the 50th anniversary so you know there there is a pattern of and what is you know I, obviously if i went into more detail we'd be here for like three or four hours everyone would go to sleep but normally uh what happens is that a bands will stop playing and never work together again for some extraordinary reason <clears throat> after we get fed up with each other we forget why we got fed up with each other and then we ring each other up and say do you fancy doing something i said oh yeah great and they said why did we get fed up with each other i can't remember <laughs> okay let's continue <laughs> maybe maybe that i was thinking like in real in real life maybe you in a partnership matrimony husband and wife, whatever, maybe that's a good element to do it because you can love one another. You you sign a contract, you are married, you marry for the rest of my life, you have kids, and things don't work out as supposed to, you know, the busy that you are five years, you sort of split up for three years, you know, they're saying, hey, man, I miss you guys, Let's, I have some idea, let's get together and, you know, play, you know, it's get it, together for another five yeah. years. And maybe that's it, a very it's a you know, so. Well, it, it's, you could call it healthy or you could call it dysfunctional. <laughs> but depends what your attitude's like. But, you know, we are now getting to the real latter end of our lives. So, yeah. you know, I don't know how long this can continue like this, but, <clears throat> you know, the great thing is that we did that tour in September and we managed to do it and we enjoyed it a lot. And, and I think the audience enjoyed it. And we acquitted ourselves when, well, 
and so it's very satisfying that we did that who knows what might happen in the future but i'm so pleased that we did that tour in america yeah it was i was there, i was you play here in dc and I, I saw you like three times there in different cities and when when i when we meet you in a couple of weeks in london i will show you some pictures that i took oh you, great you, you were like oh, well it's so well, good to be a surprise uh, as opposed to other bands like um you know, Genesis, Peter Gabriel left, he wanted to do his own thing, and they like one another, but they are not going back. You know, they, uh, the Led Zeppelin guy is split up, and they don't talk to one another. They, you know, the Pink Floyd guys, they split up their own way. It's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I suppose it's difficult to be with the same group of five guys for three years, you know, in and out, in their own house, doing their own thing, argument at the one another. You fly with with them, you tour with them, you take the bus, you take go to the same hotel. Like, it, it gets all that to begin. You may like one another, but you know, it's you know, little thing bother you more than when you are, I don't know, forty, fifty, or sixty, whatever. You know, seventy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, it's it's part of life, I suppose. You know, why many people say why people. Why great bands split up? It's a lot of money to be made, and that's not about the money anymore. You know, like the Pink no, Floyd, it, they it, have offered them so much money. Let's say Blink guy so much money. The Peter Gabriel has so much money to go back to the It's not just the money; they have done well when they sell. So it's it's right. So. Yeah, that is true. <clears throat> you can't go into the music um, for money. You've got to. Do do music because you love music and you want to make music, regardless of whether you're successful or not. And it's a terrible problem for young musicians, especially now, because to earn money, <clears throat> because of the way the paradigm of the music business has changed so much. And <clears throat> you know, so I think for the future of bands and music. It's there unless there's a radical change, uh, it's a big problem. Everyone wants music, everyone needs music, everybody, not everyone wants to pay for it. So, another uh system needs to be worked out. And I think there was a, an announcement, uh, from the head of Universal a few weeks ago acknowledging the fact that. There needs to be a new way of paying musicians for streaming because uh, the way it's set up, only the people at the top take all the money. And the, a, a band who has maybe 10,000 streams cannot earn anything, any way enough money to even pay for their rent. Or it, like, and so it needs to be recalibrated, the, all the deals. So it's a business thing. That needs to be sorted. Otherwise, there's no future for Absolutely. young people to do music. I mean, people will always try and do music. Luckily, you can do stuff at home on computers and things. But it's, you know, compared to other uh, jobs, if you like, there's just or, the, or everything stacked against young people making a living. So, you know, that is something that, um, you know, a lot of the older musicians have made clear and have said this, but it, it's, as always, you know, the history of the business of music shows us that they always come out on top compared to the artists, you know. Hey, so, uh, if, you know, hmm. Roxy Music or, I don't know, King Crimson put a new record on there. Okay, they figured out, okay, it's going to pass us between the recording, the engineering, remastering, put out there, whatever, $100,000, just to give a number, right? So how are we going to invest? Well, people don't buy, I do, but not everybody buy a lot of CDs, a lot of vinyl, everybody wants them for free. Okay, so how we record that investment? Well, we need to tour. We end up recording that band is selling t-shirts. So we need to tour to sell t-shirts or autograph or a signed poster or a picture of meet and greet. So those elements have nothing to do with music. It have to do with merchandising more than selling the record, right? So and and uh, is is that's the way with cell phone and 
and access to technology and Spotify, that we have evolved, right? So it's you we, as a musician, you, you get paid zero point zero zero four cents every time a stream from Roxy Music is is listened down there in Spotify or something. So it's 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 tough. And the the <laughs> owner of Spotify make all the money, right? So it trickled down a little by little, little to the musician, the pennies, you know. So that's right. And obviously uh you need and f- what you need is you need legislation, yeah. government is to stop that, yeah. you know, and um, or to make it more equitable. <clears throat> and the only way it can be done is through legislation. And of course, it's in a queue with hundreds of other things uh, to do with legislation. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't know what the solution is, but anyway, you're, it, the half the solution to a problem is recognizing there is a problem. So hopefully, we keep. Yeah. on about it, mentioning it <clears throat> yeah. to people and um because you know we music is just good for the brain we know that it's there's a health reason for to listen to music it helps yeah. with so many things and you could <clears throat> just see when people go to concerts the resonance they remember i'm the same you remember where you were when you first heard a track that you love of course yeah. And it has wonderful memories, and that must create good vibes, good chemicals in your brain. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, people use uh, Bandcamp, where it's more equitable, right? You get paid 90 cents of a dollar. So people say, why well, want to go to a record label? I want to create my own, you know, at home way to yeah, yeah. I put it there and I get paid 90 cents of our dollars or you, you know it's, yeah it's, well that that that's good <clears throat> yeah but you don't have the the promotion marketing marketing that post exposure that Spotify provide right so but definitely definitely is a problem it um it's very simple to solve that it's very all, simple it's all the musicians get together and say take the music out of Spotify. I don't want to be part of Spotify. I don't want to be part of Spotify. The Spotify go out of business. They will be forced to reach an agreement with the musicians. Yeah, it's uh, what it's, it is. It's not actually Spotify so much. It's the people who own Spotify. <coughs> Spotify. <laughs> Spotify. Not for Spotify. Um, and the people who own it are the record companies. Yeah. They own you know, and, and there is this non-disclosure agreement, yeah. so we can't, we don't know what really is going on, because they have non-disclosure agreements with. <clears throat> there was a, a a doco actually about Spotify. I don't know if it's on Disney or Prime or some, and it, it it it's very good. It tells you what all the issues are and uh, how it formed and all this thing and how they had to. Do deals with the big majors, and stuff like that. But luckily, as I said, um, the guy at Universal laid it out the other week, and I'm hoping that he's going to actually do something about it. And he's the he's the head of Universal in the whole world. You know, the British guy. I've forgotten his name. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope it works out because it's very unfair for the music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is. You form another band called the Explorers. The Explorer with Andy McKay. And you release uh, one record, feel free to elaborate. Or what was the idea of releasing that album? How the project came together? Well, when we stopped working with Roxy, we thought, we looked around, me and Andy, and thought, what the hell are we going to do now? This was after Avalon. Brian had gone off to do his solo thing again. And we thought, right, well, we'll form another band. <clears throat> um, and we called it The Explorers. Well, it didn't really... <laughs> go very far i didn't really explore it it wasn't a success but we we had some amazing musicians on the album then we had steve gadd on drums we had tony levin on bass wow. we had uh, rick marotta as well on drums um my goodness were fantastic musicians but you know sometimes you do something and it just doesn't take off and it didn't take off so after a couple of years, we said, you know what? This is going nowhere. Let's just stop it. Put ourselves out of this misery and get on with other things, <laughs> which we did. But it's good to have the experience. Then 
some year later, well, a couple of years later, you you guys released with uh, the brilliant album Avalon, which you know turned the life upside down again for you guys. You know, you you had been in wave rocks and all of a sudden, boom, you you went to heaven again, so to speak. Well, actually, we, no, we did Avalon first. It was after Avalon that, oh, that we did we did the Explorers. <clears throat> but you know, towards the end of the eighties, then I decided to get back to my roots and start looking at South America again. Yeah. And then I met some Cuban musicians in Italy and they invited me to Cuba. And I went back for the first time since the revolution. I toured there with them, Grupo Moncada, they were yeah. called. They were huge in, in Cuba. We paid to enormous audiences. And uh, not because of me, but because of them. <laughs> and then I started producing Rock en Español. Because I, I suddenly discovered, I started my own label, and then I discovered at Medium, I met a lot of Spanish record people and uh, who owned record companies. And I discovered that I was pretty much one of the only producers who could produce with the tradition of British production, stuff, I mean, George Martin uh, uh, influenced, and who could speak Spanish and could understand Spanish lyrics. So I became by default the number one <laughs> producer of rock and espanol so i i did fito Paez, i did Héroes del silencio i did bumbury i did draco robbie rosa i did atercio pelados wow. i did paralamas i did monica naranjo i just was just doing hundreds of of these amazingly talented <clears throat> musicians but singing in spanish yeah. And and bringing my experience of all those Roxy albums and my solo albums <clears throat> to la industria, the industry of Argentina, Colombia, yeah. Brazil, Mexico. Even I did a band there, um, Germany, France, international. I just like went bonkers, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, would you you figure out? Man, not only speak Spanish, but with all the experience that I have with rock and music, I can help this guy become a producer. Show them the way we do it in England, and that's it. Excellent, excellent. You know, you you figure out to you know, you know, earn money and do be the in between guys. You know, between the Latin culture, the the American culture, and and be only the, the be the producer as well of those albums. Yeah, and and really, um, I enjoyed that so much because. The, the ambiente of recording, the ambience of recording with those musicians was just so different uh, to working with European musicians or American musicians. It, they were just so much fun. And uh, it, it took me back to my childhood growing up in Cuba and Venezuela and, and Colombia. And yeah. it just felt like brothers, you know. And uh, we laughed so much. We had so much fun doing all that. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. Before I, I forget, I wanted to mention, uh, of course, we, we, we talk about, you know, this, the Avalon record, um, which is which is a masterpiece. And uh, this, some of, some of those were recently released as, um, you know, a hundred gram. Um, yes, new vinyl. I mean, Rhodes Studios in London, but this is another masterpiece as well. So, yeah, very, very, very good. So, then you, after you, while you were doing that, you end up uh, making a beautiful album. I really like the one with uh, John Wetton, which is, I think, uh, it's this this guy, Wetton Manson. Oh, uh, yes, with it's, John, dear John. Yeah, it's uh, 87. Well, this, this is a masterpiece as well, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. That John was a very good friend of mine. Of course, he was briefly yeah. in Roxy after King Crimson. Yeah. He he uh, joined Roxy for a little bit, but yeah. then he was really more into heavy metal, and then then he got his own band Asia and, and all that. But we stayed yeah. friends right up until he died, and he played on most of my solo albums actually, John, and sang on a, a few of them, and I. It was a dear, dear friend, and um, you know that album. 
we had you know we had such a good time recording it and we thought it was going to do well but he had problems with the record company in america and they decided that it wasn't going to do well and so they killed it really wow yeah he i think he went on tv in america and said some bad things about david geffen that and was... unfortunately, John was drinking a lot at that time, so I hate to think what he said. But, you know, it was one of those things where this guy will never work again in the music. <laughs> but having said that, you know, he, you know, this was after selling millions of albums with Asia in, in America, you know. So, you know, there's always reasons why these things happen. <clears throat> but um, that's rock and roll, you know. Sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut and then, you know, do it, <laughs> you know, look sideways and do it. Yeah. It's, it's, it has pros and cons. In, in, um, so you, you have, like you mentioned, you have collaborated with too many Latin artists, uh, uh, you know, like some in Argentina, right? Samalea, Richard Coleman. And, uh, oh, and think, yeah. yes. And yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I did. I, I did a wonderful concert in Buenos Aires at the CCK yeah. with, uh, and I had uh, guests. And Richard, wow, yeah, yeah he sang Amazona, the Roxy song, <laughs> and uh, and and we had just so many. Yes, Amalea. We had the, I had the best, yeah. like top musicians playing with me, yeah. and uh, I brought over as well uh, Lucas Polo and. Um, you know, uh, a Portuguese lady singer, and um, it was just a joy. And luckily, they filmed it and and um, and they recorded it, and um, it was a joy to hear them play some of the eight hundred one music, and and it, they were just incredible musicians you know so we had a great time and um yes yeah, so actually i forgot the other person i worked with was a guy from os mutantes sergio diaz we did an album yeah. together yeah. Um, that was my other brazilian person apart from paralamas yeah. um so you know part of my philosophy why i became a musician was to meet people and to have musical conversations and a good time with people from different countries you know so i feel that i've ticked a lot of those boxes you know and my last two years when i was working with tim finn as a singer you know he was in auckland and i was locked down here in england we managed to do two albums right yeah you know so um and we go back to 1975, you know, when I produced their first album, Split Ends, they were called, and then they became Crowded House. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Very well. That. So it's good that you, you know, you well, you were successful. You play a lot of great great band, but you never forgot your rules, and you went back to Argentina, Mexico, and Cuba. Uh, to help out some bands and uh, have fun, make a little bit of money, but you did it because you love uh, other musicians that I interview, or perhaps the majority, you know, they, they don't care about that. They only worry about why I want to go to Latin America, you know, it's it's not going to impact my life, make an impact on my life, not going to get any money, crazy countries, and uh, dangerous. Why why bother, you know, but in your case, you, you did, you know, so it's. What, <laughs> What's your well, yeah, I, I feel when I'm back in South America, I feel at home. You know, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, my brother's Argentinian. Yeah. You know, whether it's Argentina or whether it's in the southern, the northern countries, Colombia, Venezuela. Oh my God! You know, even when I even when I went to Chile, I went with with Gilmore. We went. And I, I said to him, you know, you're going to be amazed when you go to South. He hadn't been to play, really. Um, although we did do something in Colombia in 92 or something. It was a disaster. But I said, when you see the audiences in Argentina, in Brazil, in Chile, you're going to go, 
great for you. Be amazed, amazed yeah. how they love your music and the enthusiasm of it. And the and it's not you know a bunch of old people. They're young people who really like your music. That's right. People in their sixty, they bring the kids. You know, they're maybe the song have is 35, 40, which in turn bring his own kids, 15, 16. So, for example, right, when the last time I, I go to London like three times a year. So I went to London to see Peter Gabriel, I'm sorry, I, to see Eric Clapton at the Royal Albert Hall back in uh, oh, yeah. April, May last year. Yeah. And I flew to London again to see the last three shows of Genesis. Uh, at the O2, and they, you see three different generations, people in the 60s, 40s, and the 20s. The old, the old music is still resonates with a lot of, you know, so I speak the old music, the, you know, classic rock. Yeah. With a lot of people that there, you know. it's Nowadays here in United States, you know, in Roxy Music, when I was there, saw you three times, they, they were a lot of young kids, 15, 16, 17, that, you know, their parents, you know, showing, hey, this is what I used to listen when I, when I was your age, and buy vinyl, <laughs> yeah. and so it, this is amazing. And so, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's well, yeah. I mean, it's 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 the power of of music. That's why it's so valuable and so important. That's why you know I'm concerned about you know young bands being able to earn money to keep doing music. You know, for everybody, because the joy it's brought me in my whole life. Yeah. listening to other music and still does you want this and i you know i love li- you know i listen to spotify as well i just want them to pay the musicians more i i like the idea of spotify it's fantastic i can listen to all sorts of stuff um but i just want them to pay more now they've made huge profits it's about time not necessarily spotify but the actual record companies yeah. to pay what is what is accurate huh? and unfortunately well, just- yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, just uh, something that's fair. Right. It doesn't have to be ridic- fair for everybody. You know, they've made so much money, and they continue every quarter. You read about huge profits they're making. You know. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's, we we yeah. mustn't uh, just yeah. bore everybody with that. You know, we gotta be. Uh, uh, yeah, you. And now, nowadays, many artists. End up selling their rights. I think uh, let's, yeah. Genesis, uh, uh, you know, Phil Collins, uh, Tony Banks, and Mike Rutherford, and they're selling the rights for, I don't know, to a group for 300 million, and then many other groups, they say, uh, or Stevie Nick, the Every same. day. 100 million, whatever, you know, with, I don't know which company is that, but they, they sell the rights. Yes, company, I mean, company, with the music, so. I know, I read today that the doors had sold. There and yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, I think you know what's happening is that a lot of musicians my age are getting to the point where maybe in the next, sometime in the next ten years, they're going to fall off this mortal coil, <clears throat> and they're thinking about their families and right. how it's you know, and so they're thinking well perhaps we better get some money now and then my children my grandchildren and their children will okay you know be able to get some money and monetize so i i can understand why people do that yeah yeah let's talk a little bit about uh your collaboration with uh you know dave gilmore Obviously, you you play in his last uh, two solo albums. You collaborated with him on the album on an island. Feel free to and uh, feel free to whatever you want to talk about, David and Gilmer and your friendship with him and uh, the money that you own from the twenty percent that you owe him <laughs> <laughs> after giving you you know some pep talk or some lesson when you were I don't know, <laughs> you know, we need we need to interview David and ask him that question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, he is a good friend. Obviously, I, I feel like uh, uh, he's part of my family, almost like a brother, you know. Yeah. Um, and he's very humorous and fantastic player and very talented. I love his voice. 
and I love his musicality and um, it's been a joy sharing you know obviously he could just produce everything himself but it'd just be too boring and people need somebody just to uh, get a second opinion from and that's really what I was doing for like 10 years and and uh who knows i might still continue to do that <laughs> i don't know um but um it's just part of my life you know and it, we have connections and uh you know i met him through through my brother yeah. and you know we all have memories of things that we did together um and i once went we went to Colombia and actually played with Roger Ward, uh, not Roger Ward, with Roger Daltrey. Oh, I thought it was, yeah, yeah. And, and David. And it was a little bit of a disaster because we thought we were going for an environmental charity gig in Cali. And I don't know why, what we're thinking of. It was the time of Pablo Escobar and everything. And oh, I don't know how we ended up there, but when the day we arrived they said don't go to the concert it's a money laundering exercise for the cartel and we went what um so we did do the concert but there was hardly anyone there just a, a bunch of guardia civil con escopetas <laughs> it's actually there's some of it on youtube but um it was we what were we thinking of we were just just complete numpties we were, flew all the way there with all the musicians. We rehearsed. We played. It was the first time any Who songs or Pink Floyd songs were ever played in South America. Oh, yeah. um, and um, in fact, there's a, a famous Colombian writer who's done a very funny short story about that whole episode. <laughs> but that's just another adventure, you know, that I went on with with, with David and my my one of my cousins was the Capitan of the, the the plane that flew us from Bogota to to Cal as well. So it was a bit of a family affair. But wow. um luck, luckily we went back when we toured yeah with David on the Rattle That Lock tour um in Brazil and Argentina and Chile. It was a fantastic experience, you know. Yeah. It was just joyful. Um but yeah so we it's like me and Claire and, and him and Polly would like just like almost like a family uh, during those ten years, you know. And the kids were growing up, and so, and of course we had Crosby and and Nash came and sang with us quite a few times. So that was quite sad this week for this last week for Crosby to die and yeah. so you know like that, and and Jeff Beck. Too, you know, I, I only got to know Jeff because of him coming round to see David. You know, when I was there sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, you know, I've been listening and watching quite a few of his YouTube videos recently, and what an amazing, yeah. amazing! He's the only, you know, the only guitar player that Hendrix wanted to see when he came to London for the first time. Really? So I've got to check out Jeff Beck. Uh, yeah, I, I interview I interview um, Steve Hackett last week, and uh, the first ten minutes he talked about. I think it was the day after Jeff Beck passing. Yeah, Jeff. he talked about ten minutes about Jeff Beck and and yeah. coming from you know, coming from Steve Hackett. Say, I'm there is great people here, but there is Jeff up here. You know, it's, there's Jeff. Oh yeah, we all we all well, look speaking... up. Yes, and speaking about. Steve Hackett. Well, of course, we've done we, this single for Ukraine, That's right. Path to Freedom. And, yeah. um, you know, when Dimitri rang me, he said, you know, that Steve had said he was going to do it. And I said, yeah, totally. I'm, I Put me down. So, and Adam Holzman. <clears throat> and we'll do whatever we can. So I put it out on my label. Right. And, uh, and we've helped to, you know, to put up the donate sign and everything. Let's see. I know that in uh, I can see the figures and it's maybe on Spotify it's been watched about seven thousand times since last Thursday. So I'm pleased, you know, we're doing what we can. That's right. But I mean, um 
It's great to be on a record with Steve. Yeah, yeah. I've never been on a record with Steve. Well, well, you're, you're humble, man. You have you you have playing with the best of the best. So, um, any you think down the road you will be touring with David Gilmour again? Will uh, Roxy Music get together for? 50, 50 now plus 252 years reunion or or hard to do. I, um, I don't think Roger and David will ever play together again. But yeah. hey, who but who knows? But I don't I really don't think so. I think it's gone they've gone too far away from each other. Oh. And um with Roxy, you know, it we did sort of say that that would be our last gigs. Oh. You know, so I don't You know, when we finished at the O2 in September, it was a fantastic gig, our best one, I think, almost of the whole tour. It was sold out. It was a lovely experience. And I said to Brian, if that's it, then I'm happy. You know, okay. that was a great way to, to finish it. Um, I think, you know, I'm hope, hoping that we'll put out a live album from those uh, 16 gigs because I think it's different to it'll be different to all the other times we played you know it's a much different show and even though the same songs our interpretation and because of our what we can do in our 70s uh created a different kind of a different kind of roxy i mean so i'll be i'll be interested to hear it when when we come to mix it yeah what's your your motivation failed to keep on going. Obviously, you have played with the best of the, fe the best. You have done well financially. But what's the motivation? In the morning, you wake up, you get your coffee, and you know you check your email, YouTube, or Spotify, music comes to your world again, and people ping you, can you work with me in this track, on that track? What? It's, it's, it's for life. I mean, it's, you know, it, can you help it or, you know? It's, Well, I've always, I've always got music on the go. Yeah. So, you know, uh, last year I started this instrumental album with Andy, and now we've got to finish it now. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to do music that's to almost like abstract and not song. I'd done two albums with Tim Finn of songs, played all the Roxy stuff, wanted to do something quite different uh with andy as well show a different side to our musicality so that um so i've always got stuff to work on you know and because i love music and i listen to music all the time and so i'm just involved in music I, it for my health for health reasons yeah. i have to keep doing music you know i i love swimming so i do swimming and i do music And obviously, I have a big family, you know, and there's grandchildren now. And there's five so far, and there's going to be a load more. And, you know, so there's a lot going on. But music is the thing that helps the most. Any of your kids are musicians at all? Any of your... oh. No, um, no. My, my, um, no none, of, none of them are musicians. I mean, Charlie is a film director and does documentaries. I mean, he, by the age of 15, he could play everything I could play. And um, I was pleased that he didn't try and continue uh, as a musician. I could see that he had a good visual uh, eye. Yeah. And so I encouraged him to, to go into film and uh, uh, he can combine that with his knowledge of music. And my daughter, my eldest daughter is, um, runs formula one uh racing uh the business side of that and the other daughter it lives in new york works for google yeah and uh, then my stepchildren work for offshore wind in taiwan another one works for marketing well they're just everything you know yeah. charity work so it's busy yeah it's a busy it's full life Yeah, music like like you mentioned has given me uh, so much satisfaction, Phil. As I mentioned before, I don't play an instrument. I don't know how to read music, but 
I have a huge music collection. I listen two hours a day, every day, every day from the last 50 years. It's, uh, uh, it's it obviously it came from my dad, you know, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. It, uh, it's, uh, and then during the pandemic, I open one radio, I send the link to friends, they like it. A couple of companies asked me to put radios together because they like the type of music that I like to listen to. I did that and then I I said, man, you know, we are doing COVID, the pandemic, you know, people are not touring, everybody must be at home. And I began calling people and Steve Hackey was my first interview two years ago. And uh, people have been, you know, very, very nice. But, uh, I have, um, interview a lot of jazz people, a lot of electronic musician people, a lot of people from Germany that play with Tangerine Dream. Uh, I have a lot nice. of soundtracks. So I interview a lot of people to do um, create music for films and of course all the classic rocks and stuff. And uh, it's it, it's great. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy that I, I never thought that I would be able to do this stuff. And, and for me, in many ways, even if let's say that the, the my YouTube channel or the radio that generated money, I will donate every single penny for for charities or hope. Oh, well, that's very. I have, cool. done, that's very I have cool. done well in my life. If, you know, I, I'm a computer scientist and uh, yeah. I have done well, so I'm not doing it for the money. I will donate every money. Why I'm doing that is because I want to create like a library like a musical archive of interviews so down the road oh, yeah. and look back man who were the genesis guy who were the pink Floyd guy who was you know the jeff beck unfortunately i never met the guy and so for for the future generation i'm not i believe or not that it's now i'm not doing this for me like yeah. i don't know like good example would be robert free right robert free doesn't give interviews at all and he, he come across a little bit you know difficult Difficult person, but if I end up interviewing him, you know, twenty thousand people will see the interview. You know, the, another side of him, and that would make me very. Yeah. Happy. That's that's my motivation, Phil. It's uh, <laughs> so it's. Uh, but yeah, actually, I want to see the documentary. I don't know how you can't see it very easily here, but everyone says that that's fun, to, and I know um, Bill Bruford quite well, so um, he was interviewed for it. So I can't wait to see the documentary, obviously, because. We had the same management in nineteen seventy two to eighty two oh. as Crimson. I know them and knew them all. Well, I can, so I'm really looking forward to seeing the documentary. Have you seen it? Yeah, it's very good, very it's fantastic. Yeah. I went to um, so Robert Fripp came to United States back in November, December to give lectures. Uh, he was with his right hand man, and. Uh, which I interview as well, and they talk about the film, so it was, it was very interesting, you know. Uh, I don't know, as they say, I don't know Robert Fripp well. He sometimes he, you know, come across like an arrogant person. I don't, as I say, I don't know them in real life, but he was very nice, yeah. answering questions. Yeah. The, the documentary is, is excellent, you know. Of course, I love King Crimson and a lot of other music, so it's, uh, yeah. It's it's a it's it's great. Um, Good. Well, I, Claudio. I, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I do need to. Um, need to be uh, yeah. I need to be going now. But um, yeah, if in the future you want to do another one with more detail, pick out certain aspects. Then yeah, we can do come. part. We can do part two in the future when you have time, and I will. Yeah. And I will ping you when I'm in London, and then we. Yes. We get to yeah, you definitely want to visit your studio. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Come and have a cup of tea. Okay, that would be great. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Bill.